Space, for all practical purposes, goes on forever. It is hard for humans to comprehend how big the universe really is. Just getting from Earth to the Moon takes three days. If humanity is to venture farther than our celestial backyard, we are going to need propulsion systems with huge amounts of power and high efficiency. But what might those methods be? Is long-distance space travel even feasible? Let's find out. Welcome to ThoughtFed, where we explore the possibilities of humanity's future. Feel free to like, subscribe and support us on Patreon to gain early and exclusive access to additional videos. It really helps out. This is our hypothetical spacecraft. In this episode, we are only talking about propulsion methods. We will delve into the craft itself, habitation and other subjects in later episodes. So for now, we will just assume this craft has everything it needs to sustain the crew on their mission into space. So let's discuss propulsion. Chemical rockets have been used since the 1960s, launching satellites and humans into space. These rockets allowed humans to land on the moon, put thousands of satellites in orbit, send probes throughout the solar system, and land robots on Mars. Chemical rockets use either solid or liquid gaseous fuel. The fuel mixes with an oxidizer to create a chemical reaction, and that reaction creates thrust. In solid rocket engines, the fuel and oxidizer are pre-mixed into one solid form. This solid form has a flame front or burning surface that creates the combustion chamber. This combusting fuel then exits the combustion chamber through the throat and then into the nozzle where it exits as thrust. This is very similar to how a model rocket engine functions, just on a much larger scale. Solid chemical rockets are really only practical for putting payloads into orbit, not for long-distance space travel. Solid rockets cannot be shut down or restarted and therefore not functional for this application. Liquid rocket engines have two tanks. One tank is full of liquid fuel and another tank with an oxidizer. Liquid hydrogen, methane or RP1 kerosene are common fuels and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. A pump system is used to inject the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber where the mixture is ignited. The resulting combustion then exits through the throat to the nozzle and then creates thrust. While reliable and proven, liquid chemical rockets are limited by their dependence on large amounts of fuel to create the required thrust. While this method is feasible, and may be our best bet at the current time, it does still have its limitations. While liquid rockets do require large amounts of fuel, they are currently the most realistic option. Potential in-space refueling makes them even more viable. Our next example of in-space propulsion is the ion drive. While you may recognize the term from science fiction films, ion drives are real and have been used before on real missions. In fact, an ion drive was used on NASA's Deep Space and Dawn unmanned crafts launched in 1977 and 2007. Ion drives fire negatively charged particles, electrons, into a magnetic field as neutral propellant particles are mixed. Xenon is typically used as a propellant. When the neutral xenon atoms mix with the negatively charged electrons, positively charged ions are created. The charged particles then pass through two or three charged multi-aperture grids. First a positive grid, and then a negative grid. These grids further accelerate the ions as they exit. The last step is the neutralizer. This cathode emits lower power electrons into the ion beam to ensure that equal numbers of electrons and ions are being ejected. If neutralizing is not performed, the craft could gain a net negative charge. A net negative charge would attract the positive ions back towards the spacecraft and cancel out the thrust created. Each particle emitted from an ion drive delivers incredibly low amounts of thrust. However, a 
as more and more particles are ejected, the craft will continue to pick up speed. So while an ion drive could be an effective form of propulsion for a very long distance mission, it is not a viable system for shorter journeys as it takes far too long to accelerate. A craft large enough to take humans to another planet or further would take even longer to get up to speed. A larger engine would help to accelerate faster, but again, that isn't a viable option because of the size of the engine. And of course, fuel consumption and storage is a problem for a large craft over long distances. Ion drives are not going to work for us either. Let's move on. Solar sails are one of the most widely known propulsion methods. This is at least in part because we see solar sails often in science fiction and because it is an easy to understand concept. Solar sails function basically the same way the sail on a sailboat works. With a boat, the wind, made up of air particles, pushes against the sail to move the boat forward. When using a solar sail, the light particles, known as photons, from the closest large light source, typically a star, collide with the sail and propel the craft forward. The sail is made of reflective materials 40 to 100 times thinner than a sheet of paper. This allows for large sails to be deployed with minimal weight added to the craft. Solar sails themselves do not use consumable fuel like other propulsion systems, but they do have their downside. As the craft travels further and further away from the photon source, however, the thrust decreases. High-powered lasers could be used as a booster when a star is not available. However, now we are running into our mass versus thrust problem again. In order to use a solar sail to propel a craft large enough for a human mission, the size of the sail would be immense. With that much surface area, damage from space debris is inevitable. So while solar sails are effective when used to propel small craft, it is not a viable solution for a manned mission. Plasma propulsion engines are similar to electrothermal thrusters and ion drives. Similar to an ion drive, plasma propulsion engines accelerate ions. But like electrothermal thrusters, plasma is ejected to create thrust. Another difference is that a plasma propulsion engine can use a reactive fuel like argon, which is a fraction of the cost of xenon. And for manned missions, hydrogen can be used. When stored as a liquid, hydrogen is an excellent radiation shield for humans and is the most abundant element in the universe. While beyond our current technologies, this does leave open the potential for mid-mission refueling. There is potential in harvesting hydrogen from gas clouds. Deploying gas collection system. However, without technology for mid-mission refueling, we are back to enormous, unrealistic fuel tanks. Thermal fission is another older concept originally developed in the 1960s and 70s. Ground testing was even undertaken. Unfortunately, the American government cut funding and the fully developed, proven and functioning engines were never used. They worked by using nuclear fission to heat a propellant to extraordinarily high temperatures to create thrust. Fission works by impacting a neuron into a larger atom. The atom splits and the resulting energy is used to heat the propellant. Typically, hydrogen is used as the propellant. The superheated hydrogen is forced through the thrust chamber and then exits through the nozzle as thrust. As of the release of this film, fission engines are being developed jointly by the US Department of Energy and NASA for potential Mars missions. This method of propulsion does still require a large amount of consumable propellant however, and while it could be 
impossible to refuel in space. As stated before, we don't have that technology yet. Thermal fission has potential, but let's look at what else might work. Continuous fusion engines require a fusion reactor to create a net positive output. This means more power must be generated than is required to operate that engine. Scientists have been working on this power source for over 100 years. In essence, fusion recreates the reaction happening in our sun. Hydrogen atoms are combined or fused to form less helium atoms and the net result is energy. That energy is used to accelerate the propellant out the exhaust nozzle, creating thrust. As recently as 2022, scientists have finally created net gains in energy from fusion, just not enough to propel a spacecraft. Though progress is being made, it could be a very viable method in the future. Some research shows that with enough fuel, a craft could potentially get from Earth orbit to Mars orbit in just a few days. So far this is a very promising option, but it will require years more development before it can be put into practice. Pulse fusion is similar to continuous fusion. Instead of a consistent and prolonged fusion reaction, pulsed fusion uses the power from a series of very small detonations. An engine was designed in the late 1950s into the early 1960s. However, due to the partial test ban treaty, the project was forced to shut down in 1965. A very small amount of fuel, about the size of a grain of sand, could potentially produce more energy than several liters of chemical fuel. As each miniature explosion is directed at a pusher plate mounted at the rear of the spacecraft, the pusher plate would be mounted to the craft with shock absorbers. These shock absorbers would then translate energy to the rest of the spacecraft as thrust. While this is a potentially very viable propulsion method, the possible fallout damage from testing is hampering further development. We are really getting out there. Our next method of in-space propulsion is antimatter. Just like matter is made of particles, antimatter is made up of antiparticles. These antiparticles are like normal particles, but with everything in reverse. The spin and charge of antiparticles are reversed from normal particles. In an antimatter engine, first the antimatter must be separated from normal matter. Magnetic rings keep the antimatter separated until needed. As needed, the antimatter is released and collides with normal matter to release energy. That energy is directed through a nozzle and the result is thrust. While an antimatter engine may sound completely far-fetched and fantastical, it is at least hypothetically possible. Antimatter is real and we do know how to make it. Antimatter has the highest energy density of any known material. Scientists from the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts ran the map, and their conceptual antimatter vessel could make it to Mars in just 45 days using 10 thousandths of a gram of antimatter. All of this sounds great, except, to date, all of the scientists on Earth have yet to create enough antimatter to make a cup of coffee. So before we can get to the stars, we will need to develop higher yield antimatter production. Once science can produce enough fuel, an antimatter engine could output 1,000 times more energy than fission. We have exhausted any methods of propulsion that are within humanity's current ability to research. But what about the really far out ideas like wormholes and warp drives? There is the hypothesis of bending space-time or unlocking an endless supply of thrust by using a black hole. However, we would have to possess the technology to create a black hole and then control it. These are things that are way beyond our grasp at this point in time. But let's just say we worked it out. 
how would it work? Once we have created and harnessed the singularity, we could use it to utilize the Hawking radiation emitted from the black hole. The black hole would be contained in a mirrored cavity. The energy radiated from the black hole would be reflected and expelled through a nozzle, creating thrust. Again, this is hypothetical, not even theoretical, but, if we could work out how to make a singularity drive a reality, the universe could be ours. With so many potential propulsion methods, it seems that it is just a matter of time before humanity spreads its wings throughout our solar system and beyond. Which system will prevail? Which fuel will take us to the stars? Only time will tell. What do you think? Let us know in the comments, and of course if you enjoyed what you just watched, please consider liking, subscribing and sharing. We will see you again soon in our next episode. Until then, be well.